But more and more is a percentage of those people that approach me for selfie because I was this character or that character is overshadowed by the number of people, men and women, who come up to me and they say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is every day increasing. And that's what matters to me. That is what I'm proud of. I mean, of course, I'm proud of my projects. Of course, I'm proud of what I've been able to accomplish in other ways. That goes without saying, but to be able to help someone's heart heal through advocacy or through sharing your story and sharing the recovery and the solutions, that and the experience of how you are affecting and you're helping people heal, that is why you don't feel invisible anymore. Invisible. Interesting. So that is an excerpt from an interview, a podcast that Amber Heard did in, in uh, 2019, I believe right before the, the tapes dropped. Uh, in 2019, um, Amanda Decadene, I'm not sure if you know much about her. Some of you probably do. Uh, she is has been friends with Heard for a number of years. And Amanda Decadene actually has a kind of a long history in Hollywood, but also in the rock world. Uh, she married a guy from Duran Duran, John Taylor. Uh, married when she was a teenager, had a had child when she was, I think, a teenager, very young, and lived this kind of party girl lifestyle. Uh, here's a real famous photo of Amanda Decadene with Courtney Love. Uh, back in the day when Courtney was hot stuff, uh, back when uh, Nirvana was in its heyday, and or this might have been right after Kurt Cobain died, but at any rate. And so known as being a, a real wild child and a party girl and everything, but uh, Amanda, she divorced uh, John Taylor from Duran Duran, and then years later married uh, one of the guys from The Strokes, uh, the band The Strokes, Nick Valenci, and now she has, and I don't say this facetiously, but now uh, Amanda Decadene has rebranded herself as a voice for feminism, and she uh, started a photography organization called Girl Gaze, uh, whose aim is to increase the number of non-binary voices in the photography industry and to really encourage, in particular, female and, and non-binary uh photographers. So anyway, here's the thing, uh, you know, Amanda Decadene, friends with uh, Amber Heard for a number of years, um, after, right after uh, Heard had filed for divorce, uh, Amanda Decadene was pictured, uh, was photographed by paparazzi, uh, hugging Heard while Heard was supposedly on her way to church or outside church. That's an interesting little photo op, right, to, to gain public sympathy. Uh, and so, and, and she was really, and Amanda Decadene was really one of her uh, vocal uh, defenders. And I'm not at all attacking Amanda Decadene here. In fact, I think that she was not in on any kind of conspiracy. I, she's not at all on the same level as some of the other conspirators like Io and Rocky and Whitney Heard. Uh, I think that Amanda Decadene, I think she was really fooled by Amber. Uh, and you can tell, I'm going to let you hear some excerpts from this uh, interview, some more excerpts, and you can tell uh, that, that Amber really put one, on, one over on her. And, of course, we know about Amber that she's extremely charming and intelligent and, and makes a great impression. And there's a reason why Johnny Depp chose her, other than just perhaps dysfunctionality because of his own abusive mother. Um, you know, she's a really captivating person in some ways. Some of you might not want to hear that, but it's true. So anyway, I guess my point that I'm making is that I see Amanda Decadame as being one of the innocent friends in here. And so she defended Amber Heard for a long time uh, until the tapes came out and then she recanted her defense of her, her support for her. And she says she hasn't spoken to Amber since then. I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But I want to look here at... This is something that she posted on Facebook, and it's still on Facebook e even now. I guess she's forgotten about it, or maybe she just likes the picture, wants to keep it up. But, you know, we can read this here. She says, uh, repost from my girl at Amber Heard. So I guess at that point, Amber was on Facebook, perhaps, or was this Twitter? This is a photo I took of Amber at my house in the midst of her divorce. The insanity of the media made it so that she barely left her apartment. On days like this one, I would sneak her out past barriers of paparazzi, 
hidden under a blanket in the back of my car. Sometimes friends go through life experiences that are beyond challenging, not only for them, but for those that love them. This is a little like pretentious and slightly narcissistic. She seems to be almost talking more about herself than Amber. But anyway, I don't doubt that she was a good friend to her. Uh, this was one of those times. I remember she said, I know it's not easy being my friend right now. You know, notice the way that Amber is so good at exhibiting or mimicking empathy uh, when she wants to. Uh, you can see how she can really put one over on people. And this is not unusual for people with personality disorders, particularly of the, the narcissistic or sociopathic type. Learning how to show up for loved ones in crisis and not abandoning yourself and your own life in the process is a skill worth learning. You can love someone, but you can't fix the problem for them. This I've learned many, many times over. No, Amanda, you cannot fix the problem for them. And yes, you would end up learning that again. We've all got to do the work ourselves and being loved by friends makes that journey more than a little bit better. Grateful I got to be with you on the journey. Uh, grateful I got to be on the journey with you, Amber Heard, and watch you rise and flourish. All right. Uh... And then she wrote this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can go to it if you want, but she, this is online. She wrote this for Glamour. And the whole point of the article is about photographing through a woman's vision, a woman's eyes, et cetera, et cetera, sort of a feminist interpretation of photography. But of course, look at, <laughs> again, look at who the showrunner is for this article. She's got this photograph of Amber. She says it was taken after, uh, right after her divorce was finalized and she felt a mixture of she says, I witnessed my friend Amber Heard go through, the, I'm in the last paragraph, I witnessed my friend Amber Heard go through the most devastating period of her life as her marriage ended last year. What I saw was not what the rest of the world saw. I guess she's talking to some of you now, some of you debt defenders. You weren't seen correctly, apparently. All right. I simply could not fathom the level of vitriol and aggression that was aimed at her by paparazzi and online trolls looking at you, Grindelwald. All right and how that almost broke her spirit. As a photographer, there are times when I have to decide if it's appropriate to invade a moment with my camera. This was one of those times. I'm sorry, but she is rather pretentious. This was one of those times. I shot this photograph in Amber's apartment where she was with the small group of women who'd been by her side during the chaos. The chaos, some of it caused by you, Depp fans. All right, just after she learned that her divorce had been settled, it was a moment of joy, relief, and sadness all in one. All right. It's not badly written. It's just a bit pretentious. But this this was where Amanda Decadene was coming from. So again, good friend of hers, big defender. And then what happened is the tapes came out. And as you know, those tapes, the, the audio tapes between Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, uh, where she is was recorded not only admitting that she frequently attacked Johnny Depp physically and hit him repeatedly and started fights and was aggressive and out of control, but she also, on the tapes, she berates Johnny over and over for running away from fights, for being a coward, for being too passive, for not wanting to fight. And so it's very clear when you once you listen to the tapes that Amber was actually the physical, physically and psychologically abusive partner in that relationship, that Johnny was the victim of domestic violence, and that Amber did concoct a hoax uh, in order to, as I talk about in my other videos, uh, in order to up her profile as a Me Too activist and also to try to gain a financial edge on Johnny in her divorce proceedings. All right, so you can look at my other uh, videos if you want to know more about that. So these tapes came out, and it was quite an embarrassment for Amanda Decadene as, as a staunch feminist figure in Hollywood in the entertainment industry and someone with, who's launched this feminist photography business. And so she, sa she said in a, s a statement that she later released that as soon as she heard these tapes, she called Amber Heard's attorney, Robbie Kaplan. Now, let me just back up for a moment. At this point, one of the people representing Amber Heard in her legal proceedings with Johnny Depp, and we're talking way back when, in 2019, 2018, 2019, uh, was Ro Robbie Kaplan. And Robbie Kaplan is the founder of, one of the founder, main town founders of Time's Up. And if you don't know what Time's Up is, look it up. It's, it's a feminist legal fund for women who have suffered uh, sexual harassment or sexual assault, uh, particularly in the entertainment industry, I believe. All right. And so, so Time's Up was 
was one of the groups defending Amber. Robbie Kaplan was one of her attorneys. And so Amanda Decadene hears these tapes and she calls Robbie Kaplan. I guess she has her, you know, on speed dial or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. And she says, and Amanda Decadene says that, that she said to, to Robbie, what is this? I'm not okay with the way that Amber is talking to Johnny in these tapes. And so I, I, some time went by and what ended up happening is this past year, time's up and Robbie Kaplan dropped Amber Heard as the client. Now they made up this excuse about how, oh, with the pandemic, with COVID, you know, it's hard for us to, you know, to travel to where we need to be to defend her. And it's just, it was just bullshit, right? Uh, they just didn't want uh, one of their main clients to be a scam artist, right? The whole point with a lot of with a lot of the Me Too um, dialogue is the idea that you know women haven't been believed and now they should be believed, and it really doesn't look good when one of your main Me Too figures or your most public Me Too figures is someone who is running a hoax on her own domestic violence victim. <laughs> that is a problem. So they come up with an excuse, but Me Too and Robbie Kaplan drops her. It doesn't stop Ro uh, Bobby Kaplan or Robbie Kaplan from waging a kind of Twitter war against Johnny Depp followers, but that's a whole other story. All right. So I thought that, that you know, that Amanda Decadene, when we're talking about Amber's friends, I wanted to start with Amanda Decadene because I don't think that she belongs in the group with, with the others, with the, some of the co-conspirators and some of the shadier figures that we talk about, like Io and like Rocky and like Whitney Heard, Amber's sister. And, and so, you know, I, I do, despite her pretentiousness or, or whatever, I do think that Amanda Decadene was trying to be a good friend to Amber Heard. I do think that Amber Heard like gaslighted her, and I think that, that Amanda Decadene had no clue and was probably shocked when she heard those tapes, what she was hearing, apparently, right? And so she dropped her support for Amber. She refused to testify in the UK trial, and she basically issued a statement that Amber had put one over on her and had been untrustworthy and that she could no longer support her. And in fact, she issued a statement later or um, on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook somewhere saying that she hadn't spoken to Amber since then. So that relationship of many years is over. So given that information, I thought it would be interesting just for a moment, just for a few moments to go back and listen to what I thought were some of the highlights from this podcast, which came out in early 2019, right before the tapes dropped. And you hear Amanda Decadene and Amber discussing the topics of feminism, domestic violence, the violence Amber has suffered in her life. They don't ever say the words Johnny Depp, but you know, you know who they're talking about, right? And I hope that the judge knows. Okay. Uh, I don't even know if this is being used as evidence, but this is part of the defamation. Um, I think this is part of his charge of defamation is not just that she was doing this in the Washington Post, that Amber had written this defamatory article about him in the Washington Post that was broadcast everywhere in which she basically called him a domestic abuser, but that she was going around doing these different speeches and these different interviews like this one, uh, in which she talks about how awful it is to be the victim of domestic violence. Okay, and some of you have seen uh, the video. I'll play that in a moment too, just a little excerpt, which was also for Girl Gaze, also for Amanda Decadene's organization, her company, where Amber is talking about her ex experiences. Okay, so we're going to... We're going to start with uh, just a couple of excerpts from this podcast. This is the conversation with Amanda Decadene. She would interview different stars and different figures in the social justice world, the entertainment world, and all of that. So this was about a 30-minute conversation that I think you can still find on YouTube. It is. We mean to create this space and continue to push proactively to create more seats at the table. Uh, instead of trying to retrofit ourselves into a system built by and for men, we need to create our own damn system. And we can yeah. do it better. We are cooperators by nature. We are talk about how we are wired and how we have evolved. With that in mind, we need to carve out more space and do it in our in the way that we are naturally inclined to do so, which is with the help of one another. Yeah. I do believe that women, I, I believe the future is female. Yeah, I believe that too. But I think we also have a lot, we have a long way to go. Yes. That is why it's so important that we all continue to do whatever we can in our communities, in our homes, however we can. You are doing things on a much larger scale. And for me as well, to be able to see the impact that you have, I am just your terribly um, 
a proud friend, you know, that whenever I see you giving a speech or talking or saying something that is is um, in support of people who have been marginalized and who have been oppressed. And it has been such a joy to see you come into that phenomenal power and knowing that you are powerful and that you can impact in such a positive way. And I want to talk to you about what the catalyst was for you in your life, where you connected to that possibility, because it wasn't a reality yet, it was just a possibility. Yeah, you know, it's amazing because you have, you and I have known each other for so long. And you have watched this evolve in real time. And I am incredibly flattered because you've always been somebody I've looked up to. And I'm incredibly flattered to hear you say that. And it touches, it touches me in a real We've known each other for so long. You've been lying to me about who you are for so long. <laughs> no. Okay, so we'll continue listening. Listen to a bit more. Which I commend. And I've always said this about you, that when you find that voice, there is going to be no shutting you up. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> and here you are. And it's beautiful and profound. And I see the impact. And as I said, as your friend and someone who loves you, it has been one of the things that has filled my heart consistently in watching you thrive in that connection to your voice. But what for me is missing from the narrative is your own personal experience, because we don't pick things out of the air. We pick things to advocate for based on our own experiences. And I'm curious why your own narrative around gender-based violence and the many forms that it takes, that personal narrative is not part of the public story, and I'm curious why. Well, I guess the short of it is, I don't feel like... The short of it is, if you must know... <laughs> That I'm actually prohibited from defaming my ex-husband. <sighs> but I'll do it anyway, just without mentioning his name. The worst things that have happened to me are the most interesting parts of me or my story. I think what I choose to do with it is my, you know, I, the reason I don't talk about uh, a certain period of my life, the reason I don't speak about that Honestly, it's the least interesting part of my life. I don't talk about the violence that I went through. I don't talk about my, my own experience with sexual violence. I don't talk about the specifics because those individual acts, uh, uh, which I have survived uh, many di different forms of violence, many different forms, they're not the more interesting parts of me. It's the systems that allow them to be so pervasive and the actors of those injustices and that violence to function and continue to function with impunity, that's what I'm interested in breaking, baby. Well, that's the solution piece of it, right? It's yes. like, actually, and I respect what you're saying about the events themselves are almost inconsequential because they happen to so many of us and in so many forms. And it's not, a, it's, we, most of us have some form of trauma in regards to violence towards women. It is how you respond to those and how you take those and allow those to inform how you move forward. And that is the difference between someone who survives and someone who thrives. Yeah. Right. And I remember saying this to you, saying every single thing that has happened to you and everything that is happening to you at certain times where I have been with you or you've been with me when I've been going through it, those things, when we come through the other side, those things will be phenomenal gifts because we will be able to sit across from somebody, anybody who has had a similar experience and be able to look them in the eye and say, I know how you feel. This happens to me every day, but it used to be I was a kid. Okay, yes, yes. So I already played this. Uh, so anyway, I, I think you I think you get the point there. I want to show you just a brief clip to you. Probably some of you have probably seen this, but I want to show you a brief clip as well. This is also, this was posted by Amanda Decadene's Decadene, uh, company as a promotional for Girl Gaze for her company. And so this is, I think, one of the things as well that really got under Johnny Depp's skin, and rightly so, because she doesn't mention him by name, but everyone knows who she's talking about. So watch this for a moment, and, and we'll come back. I'm strong, smart. I'm not a victim. 
to my detriment. I guess there was a lot of shame attached to that, that label of victim. It happens to so many women, you know, it, when it happens in your home behind closed doors with someone you love, it's, it, it's not this straightforward. If a stranger did this, you know, as, right. as, as it was pointed out to me, if a stranger did this, it would be a no-brainer. It's the telling someone's safe is the beginning of choosing yourself. I really like think about it. If I hadn't had that, if I hadn't had a few people that I really trust around me, a few women support, a few friends, if I hadn't had them around me, how, how, how different my life would be. All right. So enough said. We're going to move on from from that, but I, I did want to talk about Amanda Decadene a bit. But but now I want to move on to some of the other actors. Now I'm not going to spend any time on Amber's girlfriend Bianca uh, really at all because again I don't think she, no one has accused her uh, with evidence of being a part of any kind of conspiracy. It's not like she's lying. She's lied or perjured herself in depositions or in court. Uh, like some of the others. And so, you know, I just want to take her at face value, especially since I know she's struggling with a significant health problem. I just want to take her at face value as someone, as another person who has fallen for Amber Heard and who is probably in the midst of being, you know, gaslit or, or what have you. Okay. So I, I see Bianca as being a good person, a, you know, a, a gentle person, much in the vein of a Johnny Depp or a, a Tasia Van Rie. In fact, I thought we could look at just briefly, and then I'm going to move on uh, because like I said, I don't think she's the most interesting in this saga, but just to give you a sense of her personality, this is a clip from several years ago at a film festival that she participated in. She produced a film. She's in, as you probably know, she's a cinematographer and, uh, and does some other things in, in the film industry. And so let's just look at these, uh, these brief clips. And then we're going to be showing their film, which is called The Dolls of Lisbon. The Dolls of Lisbon, which is an awesome Woo! feature length documentary. Yes. 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 Great. Uh, um, but the sound design took oh, actually a really long time to record all those sounds and put them in order. Um, and so I think that you you get, a, it's interesting, I, I guess Amber Heard has a type that they're all like Johnny Depp or, or whatever, because you get the vibe from her, a very sort of chilled, extremely chill, extremely laid back vibe. And I want to now talk about Amber's uh, former wife. Uh, she was married to this woman. This is the artist Tasia Van Rie. She was married to this woman for several years before they split and then she started dating Johnny Depp. This is the woman who also she committed, uh, who Amber committed domestic violence against and was arrested in an airport for hitting. Uh, and I talk about that in my, in my previous video. So yes, Amber Heard has a record of domestic violence and arrests for domestic violence. Johnny Depp is not. All right. Uh, and so uh, let's look at just a bit of video from, from Tasia. And I think you'll see it's, a very, it's interesting. It's a very similar vibe. This. Music, I think it's universal and it really it taps into to everything creative. Yeah, it's part of a Pablo Neruda poem. It says, I love you because I know no other way to love. Bow and arrow with the serpent. Arrow. Love till you bleed. You know, girls' names. Now, I think it's very interesting the way, and I'm not saying it was done intentionally in the way this film was cut, but it's it's interesting how she talks about, she uh, she has this tattoo, it says, love till you bleed. So it's a very sort of, uh, it's a kind of a, a symbol of the painful aspect of love and the destructive and self-destructive aspect of a bad relationship. And then she mentions Amber. I'm not saying she's doing that on purpose or trying to make a point, but it's just kind of ironic. Um, now, I, I did some sleuthing online and I found that there's this Tasia Van Rie fan site, and it was talking about like different different aspects of Tasia's relationship with Amber and um, and so on and so forth. But anyway, it says that she, according to this this site, it says that Tasia had the Amber tattoo removed, that she no longer has it anymore, which is interesting. And then it also posted. Uh, an excerpt of uh, Tasia's art. I don't know if this is a song or a poem or something that Tasia had published or made available in a documentary or something like that. And 
of course, this is nothing conclusive, but this Tasia fan site speculates that this was that Tasia wrote this after her breakup with Amber, that in fact this was about Amber, simply because it does seem to express what people feel at the end of a toxic relationship with someone who has a personality disorder. They feel at the end like they never really knew that person. If you've listened to the Johnny Depp Amber Heard audio tapes, you know there's a point in, in one of them where he says to her, and he doesn't say it angrily, he says it with sadness, he says, you know what? You are not there. You don't exist. You were just a thing I dreamed up in my head. And that is often, those of you who've been in toxic relationships with people with personality disorders, and if you don't know what I mean by personality disorders, look it up. But you, if you have with someone who's narcissistic or sociopathic or, or one of the others, then you know that that is one of the struggles, is trying to figure out who the real person is there. Is there a real person? Uh, of course, philosophers, some philosophers argue that we don't have a central core self, and I get that. But let's just say that people with personality disorders, for them, that is much more extreme than for the normal person. For the normal person, there is some general sense of stability. People with personality disorders, there is the false exterior self, uh, like with narcissism and sociopathy, that's very different from and masking a kind of emptiness at the core. Uh, and, and so on. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, she says, how do you move on from something that never happened? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, as if to say, like, I thought that this person loved me. I thought this person was genuine. And now I, you know, I'm, I don't have them anymore. She dumped me. I'm trying to move on. And I realize now that I, just like what Johnny Depp said, that this person was never really there. It, it wasn't real. So that's interesting. All right, so let's talk about the main event, uh, the people that I think you probably really wanted to talk about. And uh, here they are. Uh, we've got the Merry Trio here, the Merry Gang of Associates. I'm sure they're just having a great time right now with all of these subpoenas <laughs> that have been flooding in uh, from Depp's team. Uh, they didn't realize when they staged this hoax, this conspiracy, that it was going to blow up like it did. Because remember, Originally, and you can go back and look in my other videos for this, originally it was supposed to be a pretty easy end game. Uh, Amber Depp would intimidate Johnny Depp into a larger financial settlement, and then he would kind of scurry away and cower in the corner, because remember, he's a coward, she says. He never wants to fight. So that that pussy is, is not going to fight, and I'll just go around defaming him to the Washington Post and to in these interviews and at these women's marches and so on and so forth, and he's not going to do anything. Well, he did something. He had enough, and so now, uh, and for the past uh, couple of years, he has been waging a legal war against Heard in court, and um, the, the, the main event is coming up in Virginia in May, all right? So anyway, the point, where was I going with that? I was just saying that, um, you know, the, that her co-conspirators in this, her friends and her sister, I'm sure, and we've talked about this online, I'm sure that they never thought it would get to this point where they would be getting all of these subpoenas and have basically like the legal wrath of God, you know, threatening to come down on them. All right, so let's talk about Io Till It Right. Uh, I'm referring to him as he because he is, he is in the midst of undergoing a, uh, a sex change. And so if you look at earlier pictures of Io, he looks feminine, was, you know, short, sort of butch, short haircut and a butch look, but feminine, a woman, recognizably a woman. And he's been transitioning. And so this is a pretty good reputation, uh, representation of what he looks like now. This is his partner. I think maybe they're married. I should know that, but I'm sorry, I forgot. But this is his long-term domestic partner, perhaps wife, not sure. But her name is Rachel Lee. And from what I could find online, she is a stylist. Uh, gets a lot of work in movies and magazines and stuff like that. So a successful stylist and seems to be a, a feminist activist, um, a social justice activist like, like the rest of them in this group. Now, Io I wrote a book oh, a couple of years ago. This was published in the last year or two. Again, I'm terrible with dates. I just don't care. Uh, but anyway, this is called, it's called Darling Days, and it's interesting because it gets a lot of insight into Io's background, and what I really want to do in this video is, I, I know that we like to be snarky on Twitter, and myself just as much as anyone, I was laughing about that dress 
with the rest of you that, that I posted that Amber heard for <laughs> to the Vanity Fair party. Um, so I like to be snarky too. And these people, of course, I'm angry at these people for what they're doing to Johnny and they're carrying out this hoax and these lies and they're destroying a good man and it's narcissistic and it's toxic and it's terrible. I'd agree with all of that. But I do, I don't want to caricature them in these videos as just, the, you know, these evil villainous characters um, because, uh, you know, when we're talking about Amber or when we're talking about Io and maybe some of the others too, Whitney, there, there is a core of tragedy in their background that I think is very much contributing to who they are. And that, that's not letting anyone off the hook and that's not saying that we, we can't be angry, you can't be angry. But I think that we have to be mature and we have to understand that people are the products of two things. They are the products of, on a basic level, their biology, how their brain is made, how it functions, their, their brain chemistry, their brain composition, their DNA, their hormones. And then they're also the product, as we know, of their upbringing. And, you know, most uh, psychologists believe that the personality of a human being is more or less set by the age of five or six. Now, of course, you can make changes. I've made big changes in my life, things that I don't like and all of that. So it's not hopeless. And of course, we, you know, we're ethically culpable for our behavior. But um, these types of people do not come out of nowhere. Someone like Amber Heard did not come out of nowhere. Uh, and as you probably know, she has a, an extensive history of abuse in her background. And we'll talk about that in a little while. All right. So what's in Io's background the, that's of interest? Well, she talks about it in Darling Days. Uh, her mother was a pretty severe alcoholic and drug addict. Uh, they lived a pretty squalid life. Uh, in New York City, but her mother was also a model um, who was photographed. She didn't make a lot of money. Uh, she was she did more sort of artsy photographs. She was the favorite of a of an edgy photographer named Nan Golden, and Nan Golden was really famous in the uh, '80s for taking photographs of people in really edgy situations or squalid situations and really sort of extreme photographs. So she was a model in that sense. She did do some other light modeling work, I believe but um, sort of an edgier model, didn't make a lot of money, lived this edgy sort of addicted lifestyle. Uh, here is a picture, a recent a picture from, of her from a more recent story. This came out in the last year or two. Uh, Io's mother is in the center. And this was a retrospective on some of the famous models from the 70s and 80s. And the woman hugging her is actually Patty Hansen, Keith Richards' wife. As you know, Keith Richards is a really good friend of Johnny Depp's. In fact, after Johnny Depp finished testifying at the UK trial, he, where's the first place he went? He went to stay with Keith Richards and Keith Richards' son, who's his best, one of his best friends. And so, you know, this just shows what a small world it is that you've got one of Johnny's best friend's wives hugging on um, the mother of one of the women, or now men, hugging on Io's mother, uh, the person who is trying to help destroy Johnny Depp uh, in court. So just interesting, a small world. Um, I have, this is another picture. This was a picture taken by Nan Golden. You can see Io there. Um, Io said that from the beginning, he felt like a boy and, and took on that gender identity at an early age. And then you see this is his mother there. But they lived in very, very kind of squalid conditions. And, and she, was, she was somewhat abusive. And it, and, and it was a pro very problematic upbringing for Io. And he talks about it in this video. I just want to show you a, a brief excerpt so we can get more of a sense of how it was for Io growing up. Growing up in the East Village, there wasn't a lot of food, there wasn't a lot of electricity, but I don't see myself as a victim and I don't see it as something that I'm running around crying about. Sure, my parents had drug problems, but like I was given by my parents a sense that my notion of myself was the most important thing. And I lived as a boy for eight years as a kid and they respected who I told them that I was. They fucking nailed it on that front. You do shit way early when you grow up in New York. All right, so again, you know, I just think it's interesting to know something about, about Io's background. And, you know, typically what we find in situations where someone comes from an abusive background is that they either swing one way or the other. It either, it's either contributes to making them a better person or they take on 
a number of pathologies that they acquire from that upbringing. And so I don't want to speculate. I, I don't know IO, but I'm just saying that, um, you know, some people online have saying, well, uh, saying, oh, well, she's a narcissist as well. And look at this sociopathic behavior and everything. And I'm not excusing it at all. I'm just saying that, you know, we look at her background. There was a lot of concerning stuff going on. So again, I'm just more into, in these videos, I'm more into explanations than castigation. All right. So what happened with Io's relationship with Johnny? Because initially, and Io has even conceded this, initially, um, Johnny welcomed her as Amber's best friend and even allowed Io to live for a long period of time rent free in one of Johnny's uh, penthouses. And so, you know, they, I, and Io even says for a while he was like a, a brother or an uncle or something to me. But then what happened, one of the things that happened to sour their relationship is that Io was doing a project on gender and she was photographing, she was photographing a thousand or something people who didn't fit on the straight or gay um, or didn't fit in the, the binary system, but they were somewhere in the middle, something like that. It was some kind of gender project. Um, and so she, uh, she got Lily Rose Depp, Johnny Depp's daughter, to participate, which she was happy to do. But what Lily Rose Depp and Johnny Depp didn't realize is that Io took a photo from this and put it on Instagram or whatever. And in and alongside that photo, she basically, to paraphrase, she basically labeled Lily Rose Depp as bisexual or gay and not exclusively straight. She didn't use those, those exact words, but that's what she was saying. And, and nothing wrong with that, with being bisexual or gay, except Lily Rose didn't feel like that was really who she was, and she didn't want that, rep, that information getting out there just because it wasn't accurate. And so anyway, um, that was something that really, like, uh, like uh, Johnny Depp really from that point on saw Io as a kind of an untrustworthy opportunist. And I don't think that was a wrong view. That was a wrong assertion, right? So their relationship kind of soured. And then what happened is after Amber Heard decided that she was going to um, file this restraining order and accuse Johnny Depp falsely, I would say, of domestic violence, um, after she concocted this plan, then part of her plan was that she would stay, Amber would stage this fake incident with, with a cell phone where she would be on the phone with Io while she was with Johnny. So Amber and Johnny together, and then Amber on the phone with Io saying, oh my God, Johnny's hitting me or leave me alone, Johnny, or whatever. That would compel Io, who is another part of the country, to call 911. And so they would have a phone call on the record attesting that there was violence going on. Uh, you can watch some of the other videos. You can watch uh, Brian McPherson's videos where he gets into this. I'll link to his videos in the bottom. He gets into all of this in great detail, so I'm not going to hash it out, all right? That's something for another video. But I'm just letting you know that Io was a part of this hoax, and then Io submitted depositions and testimony for the UK trial, and I would assume for the upcoming trial in which she um, def basically lies about some things for Amber Heard and also passes on these stories that Amber had been telling her for a while about how she was in an abusive relationship. All right. And if you want verification of the fact that Io was lying, then again, uh, look at some of these other videos, like the videos of Brian McPherson, where he does a, a great forensic analysis. All right. Now, why would Io and some of these others' uh, friends lie? Well, one thing is that Amber, we've talked about this, Amber gives them this great access to the celebrity lifestyle. And this was the photo that I posted the other day that some of you were freaking out about because of what Amber is wearing. It's funny, I didn't even notice what she was wearing uh, until you started pointing it out. Uh, but um, this is the Vanity Fair uh, Oscars party in 2018. And this is considered to be the Hollywood party to go to, or maybe like one of the top, you know, three or four parties to go to in Hollywood. Very exclusive event. Um, not even entirely sure how Amber got in, except that she does have those Aquaman movies and she has a big feminist profile that is really popular right now in Hollywood. And so anyway, you know, here's her, here she is with uh, Io as her guest. Now, let me, let me ask you, where would Io get access to this lifestyle if Amber were not making it available, you know? And so this is one of the claims that a lot of us are making is that, um, her co-conspirators were very much incentivized through this and various other things, and probably I would theorize that she's actually paying them off, but I don't have 
you know, proof of that, but they're very incentivized to lie and to keep the scam going. Um, now, another uh, friend is Raquel Pennington, also known as Rocky Pennington. Uh, here is a photo taken of Amber a day, I talked about this in the other video, a day after she was pictured uh, outside court with a supposed bruise on her face. Interesting how the bruise has completely disappeared, even though she's not wearing any makeup. But this is her with Raquel. She calls Raquel her spiritual BFF. And again, Raquel is another one who has um, contributed false testimony, just like with Io, and is, is basically helping Amber Heard with this scam. Um, now, again, the question would be, why is Raquel doing this? Well, I would say the same motives that Io has, which is that uh, Amber Heard provides access to a very exclusive lifestyle. They go to, you know, um, Raquel is able to go to premieres uh, because of Amber. And so again, you know, and, and, and the thing to understand too with people like this, manipulative people like Amber Heard, is that they are so good at manipulating that they don't, the person whom they're manipulating, they, they don't even realize fully what they're getting into, right? So it's not like Amber presented this, I'm sure, to her friends, like, oh, we're going to do this big scam and this big hoax, and then we're going to have to testify at these different trials, and you're going to have to lie for me in court, and you're going to get all of this bad publicity, and all of these depth people are going to be on to you, and Brian McPherson's going to be making videos about you, etc. No, they didn't think any of that was going to happen. I'm sure she played it off to them uh, and gaslit them about it. Oh, it's no big deal, and look at everything I've done for you, and, I don't know, and we're just going to lie a little bit, and then Johnny's such a pussy that he'll let it go, and, you know, and this, this thing is, as often happens with the people who have personality disorders, they get in deeper and deeper and deeper and they take people down with them in various ways. And that's what's going on right now. You know, one thing that's interesting about Rocky or Raquel is that she had seemed to have very contentious relationships with um, a number of the people in Amber's group. So her personality was Rocky. She had that nickname for a good reason. Uh, one of the things that came out in the depositions for the UK trial and for the current one is that Rocky and Io got into a fist fight over who was going to plan Amber's wedding. Uh, in fact, Io hit Rocky so hard or so much during that altercation that she was given by the group the nickname, I slap Rocky. Ha ha ha. So, you know, this is a group of friends that celebrate violence. I have to say, this is a, a group of people that celebrate violence, at least female violence. They see nothing wrong with it, which again, tells us something. Um, and then also, uh, Rocky seemed to have a problematic relationship with Whitney Heard, Amber's sister. And one of the interesting things that came out in Jennifer Howell's letter to Whitney, which was originally a private letter, but ended up coming out later, is that Whitney, Amber Heard's sister, had a real profound distaste for Raquel uh, Pennington, for Rocky, uh, because she felt that Rocky was very selfish, self-interested, narcissistic, and that she was basically a kind of a freeloader, that she was mooching off of Johnny and off of Amber. And of course, we know that one of the things that Johnny discovered after he divorced Amber is that Amber, um, or when he was divorcing Amber, is that Amber had allowed Raquel to use one of the empty penthouses of Johnny's as her studio for her jewelry company. Her jewelry company is called Hanuman Hart. H-A-N-U-M-A-N, Hanuman Hart, kind of a weird name, but she had this sort of artisanal jewelry craft, small little business that she was trying to get off the ground. And Amber never told Johnny that she was used, that Raquel was using one of his penthouses as her base of operations. And so, you know, these, uh, some of these people are just, they're just extremely narcissistic, sort of freeloading people who are who were there to take advantage of Johnny via Amber. And that's why they've continued to stick with Amber is because they're getting something out of it. And I talked about that earlier, and I'll continue to talk about it. Now, the last person that I want to talk about here, and I think that in some ways, she is the most uh, interesting figure, is Whitney, Amber's sister. 
And here she is a picture standing next to Keith Richards. Uh, so, you know, that's... <laughs> Again, this was one of the perks of being with Johnny Depp, and one of the reasons why Amber uh, went after him is because, you know, she was definitely not hanging out with Keith Richards, and neither was her sister before she got with Johnny Depp, all right? But this is her sister, and her sister was one of the main people that supported her uh, at the UK trial, and so you can see that, you know, Amber came, famously came in holding hands with her sister, the sister's one with the on the left with the long hair and the brown bag. And then that is on the right is Jennifer Robinson. She is a really famous UK attorney and also one of the best friends, I think like the best friend of Amal Clooney. So again, it's this in Hollywood, it's this really like tight, exclusive <laughs> group. And so you don't have to go very far to find someone who's married to or knows a movie star or whatever. But anyway. And so they put on this big production, right, of walking into the U in and out of the UK court every day, you know, holding hands and everything. And her sister was right there supporting her. This is another, this, oh, this picture really irritates me. Look at that haughty, I, I'm getting away with it and you can't do anything about it look that Amber has on her face. And then even her sister, what are you smiling about, Whitney? Well, so Whitney perjured herself at the UK trial and in which she made up all of these stories about how Johnny Depp, you know, beat up on her sister and her sister, you know, never beat up on anybody and blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, then it, it's interesting because that testimony is contradicted by a number of things. All right. First of all, there was video given to the judge in the UK trial that was and it was leaked or released. And in this video, we see uh, Amber Heard's sister, Whitney. She was apparently filming a reality show pilot or trying to do a reality show. I guess she was trying to break into the movie industry as well. And um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. It speaks for itself. So we're going to play it. You do it. Did you get in a fight or something? Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Got into an altercation. Ow. I already talked about it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I can't believe Amber beat your ass. I know you could beat her ass. We're not going to oh, talk man. about that. Whitney, truth or dare. Okay, did you really start the fight with your sister or did she start it? For real, for real, for real. We're not going to oh, talk man. about that. She yes. really did whoop do your butt. Oh, we're, we're not glad. talking about it. Yeah, I'm do I guess I'm done talking about it. Now, I think it's pretty self-explanatory what we're seeing here. Everyone around Whitney is noticing that she has these bruises. They're not visible to me exactly on this camera, on the camera, but um, everybody can see these bruises. They're pointing them out, and they keep saying to her, as if they've been told previously that Amber was the one who beat her, they keep saying, I can't believe that you let your sister beat you like this. I can't believe you let Amber beat up on you like this. Wow, Amber really whooped your butt. Very clear what's going on here. And, and Whitney does not deny it. Do you think that if Amber, her sister, had not been the one who had beaten her, that she would allow that impression to continue on camera? But she does. She just kind of smiles and shrugs it off. It's very obvious that she is admitting that Amber was the one who put bruises on her. Now, I told you this went before the UK judge. Well, Whitney got on the stand and she told the UK judge that Amber never hit her and that this was basically just a storyline that the producers concocted, the producers of this reality show concocted to try to make it more interesting. Uh-huh. So you're telling me that the producers just decided that of, out of all the random storylines they could come up with, they decided that they would concoct a domestic violence storyline where the one of the contestant's sister is beating her up and then have her discuss that on camera and that person just happens to that they select for this storyline just happens to be Whitney Heard. Come on. No. Uh, the judge just dismissed it though. Like I said, the UK judge was terrible. He took everything Amber and her friends and sisters said at face value and dismissed all of the much, much greater, much, much more substantiated uh, testimony and evidence that Johnny Depp had. He just, he just didn't like Depp or he didn't like the idea of uh, admitting that a woman could lie about assault and domestic violence. All right. So uh, why is Whitney doing this? Well, one of the things you need to understand is that Amber and Whitney apparently have this abusive codependent relationship going back many years to when they were child little children. Uh, Amber's father was very abusive. Apparently he would beat up the mother regularly in front of them, of the girls. There's also another sister in the mix, but we don't know who she is. She stayed out of the limelight, all right, and she's not associated with Amber. 
But basically, the way that these two, Amber and Whitney, grew up was they grew up in mutual fear and terror of their father, and it formed a very tight bond. Now, I've mentioned in the past that when someone goes through abuse, they usually tend to break one of two ways. One, it will make them become abusive later in life, and so we see that with Amber, for instance. Or two, uh, they often become um, more gentle uh, and, and hate abusive behavior or not violent, right? And we see that with Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp's mother beat him, he said, like every day and was the meanest person he'd ever met. I wonder why he ended up with Amber. Hello, we're going to talk about Freud sometime in a later video, but it's very clear what's going on here. But anyway, Johnny, very passive. People commonly refer to him as the most gentle person they've met. Um, Joe Perry in the Hollywood Vamp Vampires Band said that Johnny Depp is the least violent person on the planet. And I think Whitney is another example of this. Uh, Whitney seems to be a very, very sort of meek and cowed figure next to Amber. So Amber became violent and abusive, and Whitney became this very sort of gentle, passive character. And so I really do think I, that she that she has basically been cowed by her sister and has just been in this mold, this abusive mold for a long time of doing whatever Amber wants her to do. And Jennifer Howell basically said as much. Now. Jennifer Howell is the former best friend of Whitney Hurd. So Amber's sister, Whitney, this was her best friend. Uh, Whitney also wor worked for Jennifer Howell for a while at an, her organization. It's called the Art of Elysium, and it's a charity art organization. Uh, they actually gave an award to Amber Heard several years ago uh, for work that she had done for them. This was before um, all of this went down. And uh, Jennifer Howell is one of those who has testified in a deposition in favor of Johnny Depp. She says that, that Amber's sister Whitney told her constantly that uh, Amber was super violent, was scary. She was afraid Amber would kill Johnny one day. Uh, she couldn't understand why Johnny was putting up with this behavior. And so uh, Jennifer Howell says that, that Whitney never said that Johnny was abusive. In fact, she depicted him as the victim of Amber's domestic violence. And Jennifer Howell also testified that Whitney was so afraid of her sister because her sister would attack her sometimes that for a while she came and lived with, uh, with Jennifer, with Jennifer Howell. And Jennifer Howell has no reason to lie. All right. Um, and so this is, uh, this is taken off of Johnny Depp's uh, lawyer, Adam Waldman's page online. Um, and it's, it's a bit of Jennifer Howell's testimony. Um, I, you know, I, I think you probably already read this. I'm going to pause it. You can read through it yourself. It says some interesting things. So, you know, here it's you know, very sympathetic. She says, if, if you look at the last paragraph, she says, um, second sentence on the last paragraph, you know me and know that if subpoenaed or brought into this or anything else that I would always be honest. I love Amber and have compassion for her because she is your sister and I know what you guys went through as kids, the abuse they suffered from the dad. The two of you have literally been through hell together, and I know you would do anything in the world for her. She is your older sister. You just lost your mother, and you were a mom for the first time. It is a time she thought of you and your needs and put them above her own needs. All right? And so, and look at the last line, the very last line of this. You, Whitney, are worthy of love, worthy of being seen for all your light and beauty, and worthy of not having to clean up another mess that is not yours. I mean, just really very astounding testimony. Uh... And so I think that's very, that's very interesting. And so I see Whitney as being more of a tragic figure. Um, I mean, you know, I guess they, they all are. Amber's a tragic figure. Uh, she's, she's perpetrating something terrible against Johnny Depp. And she's a violent um, person. And she is sociopathic and toxic. And I'll agree with all of those things. But at the same time, we can have some compassion for the fact that she is that way because of, uh, you know, a combination of circumstances, but largely, I'm sure, because of the violence that she saw growing up. And it just, it just set off something in the brain, right? Some people react differently. And so anyway, two, you know, we just have to understand that there's, it's not, there's this extreme amount of, of filial bond, as Jennifer Howe said, a filial sisterly bond between these girls, even though it's dysfunctional and it's abusive toward Whitney. Um, I think that she she does feel this great obligation to her sister. And in that sense, I, I feel sorry for her because she's yet another person who's gotten drawn into this web of someone who's manipulative and toxic. Um, you know, this was something, there's a picture that Amber posted on her 
uh, Instagram page, and this is uh, it's a picture with Whitney hugging her, and uh, and Amber says sisterly love next to the picture. I don't know why I don't have it here, but Amber says sisterly love next to the picture, and then Whitney has responded from her own Instagram account on this picture to this picture, and she says I can't imagine going through. Um, this craziness uh, without you, or I'm glad that I'm here to go through all this insanity with you, basically making reference to the trial and all of the legal stuff, as if Amber is just this innocent person who's being persecuted and is ha having all of this forced, this craziness forced on her herself, which is really not the case, as we know. Uh, she instigated a lot of this, got the ball rolling. But this, I think this really shows here, and of course this is also the image that Amber is wanting to project as well, right, of sisterly, um, of sisterly dedication and that her sister is totally on her side. So for all I know, you know, they could be having arguments every single day where her sister says, I can't do this anymore, and Amber's like, you've got to, or whatever. But they at least present a united front, a, a united PR front online. So now... Some of you are probably saying, what about Cara Delevingne? Uh, she's not a key player in this, but I know that she's been in the news, uh, so I wanted to just say a couple of things. Uh, she is a famous English model and aristocrat. Uh, she is uh, gay. She dated Ashley Benson. Um, so she's seen as a kind of a lesbian activist in, um, in the modeling world, in the entertainment industry, and she and Amber became pretty good friends. Now, when Amber dated Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, this is the person that she was cheating on Johnny Depp with, uh, among others, and she dated him after Johnny, and Elon ended up helping to bankroll her legal defense and also um, donated money to the ACLU so that Amber would have to, would, could pocket her settlement from Johnny Depp, etc., uh, I love this picture because some people speculated that this was a bruise that Amber had given Elon, uh, that she was abusive with him as well. And it sure does look like he got clocked in the, in the eye, doesn't it? Someone even said, too, that if you look at her knuckles in this picture, you can't see them in this photo, but apparently if you, look, if you can see them, if you look at the knuckles, that her knuckles are all red, like she's hit somebody. Anyway, here's the point. Um, Amber, you know, was cheating with Elon. There's, there's elevator footage, like I said in the last video, of her and Elon going up to the penthouse while Johnny Depp is, is out of town. But one of the stories that came out in the depositions, one of the things that actually one of Amber's own friends admitted is that Amber had a threesome with Elon and with Cara Delevingne. And so if you've heard about her, that's probably, that's probably what you've heard. All right. So where does this all leave us? I said, you know, I, I said that I wanted to do a little bit of analysis of the dynamics of Amber's group. And I, we've done that a bit already. But I think that one of the things that it's important to understand is that Johnny Depp, in his testimony, he said that he believed that her friends were afraid of her. And I don't think that he would say that if there were not some merit in that. And so, you know, we, we've we looked at Amber's friends, we've looked at Io, and we've looked at Rocky, and we've looked at Whitney, and as, as well as some of the, the minor characters in this, and we, we tend to see them through the lens of being these really devious, sociopathic individuals, of seeing them as we see Amber. And um, while I, I certainly agree that um, this that there's something wrong with them that this is definitely unethical behavior. I think that we can't underestimate probably how much high level, next level manipulation and intimidation and even threats are going on at the level of Amber to try to keep them in the pack. Because here's the thing, and I've said this online. When this, it's one thing to perjure yourself in the United Kingdom where you can scurry back across the ocean or in some cases they never had to go to begin with. They just sent their deposition. They can't get us in the UK. We Americans, we're not going to be extradited for perjury in a civil case. <laughs> okay. But over here, it's a different thing. And the, the links to which Amber and her associates are carrying out this hoax you know, Virginia is going to be a big deal. Virginia is not going to be the UK redux, all right? This judge is very different. He looks like he's going to be taking this much more seriously. Uh, Johnny Depp and his team have a lot more firepower than they did last time. Um, they have a, a lot more evidence that they have had time to assemble than they did last time. 
And this May trial is going to be a shit show for Amber and for her associates. And it's going to put them, I believe, in legal jeopardy. And it's going, if nothing else, it's going to really sully their reputations and expose them and give them a lot of attention that they don't want. So they have to be getting extremely uncomfortable right now. I would imagine that the feeling they have is of the walls closing in. And so what a number of us have been speculating about online is, uh, is there going to reach a tipping point? Maybe it's already happened. We don't know what's, what negotiations are going on behind the scenes, but is it going to reach a tipping point where someone is going to break and they're going to say, uh, I just can't do this anymore. All right. And that's what's really interesting is who is going to crack and who is going to jump ship, uh, who's going to jump the, the Amber defense uh, ship. All right. I hope that you've uh, enjoyed this. I didn't get a chance to say nearly everything that I wanted to. A number of other thoughts that I would love to share, discuss about uh, Amber and her group and the dynamics of what's going on. And then there's a number of other video ideas that I have that I'm, I'm going to be making in the upcoming weeks and months. So, um, you know, I have a lot of time on my hand. Uh, and so I really uh, wanted to... I want to start making these videos and getting more of them out there. So please subscribe and pass this video on if you enjoyed it. And please let me know in the comments uh, what kinds of videos you would like in the future. Are there any topics that you find particularly compelling? And I'll get in there. I'll do the research and I'll come up with things to say and discuss. All right. Uh, so don't forget to subscribe and pass this video on if you liked it. Bye-bye.